Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I'm jumping the gun there. Welcome to Wearable Devices first seminar. Thank you for being with us. Our white paper is available at www.wearabledevices.co.il forward slash white paper. So please feel free to download it. Books of dust covers. This pre-introductory part of the webinar is its dust cover. And the next 60 some seconds sums up this webinar. So if you don't wanna stay for the full time, just listen to the next 60 seconds and it'll explain to you what's up. All right. Throughout our research for the white paper, we embarked on a comprehensive exploration of the subject matter. Our aim was to provide valuable insights into the development of a neural input interface that meets the needs of users and customers and aligns with industry requirements. We were trying and hopefully succeeded in formalizing a new taxonomy, a new framework, and to unify multiple domain expertise with constant requests, questions, and challenges to distill and organize the insights about what makes a neural wearable interface accepted by the market. This market, neural wearable interfaces, is now in the pre-standards phase, where standards are not yet defined, and the whole market is about to experience a massive paradigm shift that will catch many XR product managers and interaction designers off guard. Working on the white paper encompassed more than 1,000 man hours. Developing a wearable brain computer interface is one of the most challenging tasks of our time. It involves neurotech, machine learning, artificial intelligence, multidisciplinary engineering, UX and UI design, and ergonomics design, all focused on solving the challenge. We started the company with a vision and goal of creating a mass consumer device rather than a mere research project. We considered the functionality of the device and how it could be achieved through sensor selection and the processing of signals. We recognized the importance of integrating hardware, software, and the overall system architecture into a cohesive design. And the location? Location is the first rule of business. For the product to be a wearable, customers must be willing to wear it. Spatial computing is now gaining traction with new face-worn devices, ambient computing, generative AI, and wearables converging. And we believe that our approach will drive the industry into standardization of gesture input for extended reality experiences. In fact, our motto is setting the input standard for extended reality experiences. Our research journey aimed to address industry needs and contribute to the development of an innovative and effective solution that delivers on both functionality and usability. Wearable Devices was established in, 2000, uh, in 2014 and turned public almost a year ago. We're happy to share our deep expertise, a unique perspective, and demonstrate how passionate we are about connecting people with computers. So what do we actually mean when we say developing a neural input wristband for extended reality experiences as the white paper is titled? First off, and we'll cover this later, we interact with computers either by holding an interface like a PC mouse, touching an interface like a touch screen, or moving our body with voice or gestures. Extended reality experiences are those where the user inputs simple commands in relaxed body postures in contrast to pinpoint navigation between two letters on a Word document or scrolling through a social feed on a tablet. Spatial postures are natural and intuitive and require simple point, click, drag and drop, also known as pointing device functionality. The most common pointing device, of course, is the computer mouse. A reminder to those watching that you can access and download the white paper at www.wearabledevices.co.il forward slash white paper. Many of the illustrations I'll refer to are in the document. It's a comprehensive paper, 28 pages long, in fact, and we could have easily doubled that. We'd love to learn what you think about it, so please contact us if you'd like to discuss it. To develop a neural input wristband, you first need to define what the product is going to do, which is usually spread across two categories, either a pointing device or a character device. In this session and in our white paper, we're focusing on pointing device functionality, which if stripped down to its absolute core consists of the following three functions, point, click, drag and drop. This is known also as navigation, selection, 
and element interaction. There's the saying, as far as the customer is concerned, the interface is the product. When we evaluate input for consumer electronics and digital devices, we need to consider the full use case and scenarios, what the user intends to do, what is the controlled device type, how is the user going to achieve the goal? And on top of that, what is the user's environment, indoors or outdoors, focused or multitasking, resting, relaxed or on the go? These are the inputs of the system in its environment. What about the outputs? So we've mentioned that a pointing device eventually outputs navigation, selection, and element interaction. And the device itself is very complex as it has hundreds of parameters and trade-offs to consider regarding the product design, the algorithm system, and the sensors. In addition, there are motion artifacts and noise to consider. Moreover, are these fine, minute, barely visible finger movements, or are these big mid-arm gestures, minority report style, And what happens if you want to integrate certain aspects of our technology into an existing wrist-worn device or we'll have a co-branded device with a design partner? In this case, further constraints on the specifications may arise. So integration and licensing of this technology floats many additional requirements and constraints. And the white paper's goal is to show how these various requirements and trade-offs are translated to an accurate, comfortable, and functional product with a wonderful user experience. HCI, or human-computer interaction, is conveyed through user input and computer output. The user forms an intent, and the intent is expressed by selecting and executing an input action. The best interface, the champion, is a natural and intuitive interface. Now, exactly what does that mean? Natural means you perform the input using comfortable and relaxed body movement. You are relaxed. Your body resides in a natural posture. Intuitive means you perform input using familiar and common methods. An intuitive gesture is a gesture which binds the same functionality with the same gesture for any device. Biologically, the brain actualizes an action potential, indicating an intended movement. The signal travels down the spinal cord, activating the nervous system, triggering appropriate muscle groups, and executing the movement. Issuing digital commands requires an input device or interface. These can include keyboard, mouse, touchscreen, pointing device, gesture, recognition system, or character device. Humans receive an extraordinary amount of input compared to output. Indeed, our senses only reliably process about 1% of gathered input. The various and parallel sensory channels, including visual, auditory, and proprioception via the eyes, ears, and hands, gather the input extraordinarily rapidly. Conversely, human output is relatively slow, requiring significant muscular activities. A natural interfaces, interface bridges the gap between human input and output, making for a natural and intuitive real life experience. And remember, natural is comfortable, intuitive is familiar. Extant technologies utilize mechanical transducers, such as keyboards, mice, and touchpads. The human body activates up to 14 muscles to control hand and finger movements for these activities. With wearable computers such as AR and VR, interaction design can take a quantum leap. It is therefore crucial to develop new interfaces specifically de designed to support wearable devices. Body posture manifests differently depending on the interaction with the computerized device. PCs require a lean forward posture. Smartphones may require a more laid back posture. Virtual or augmented reality necessitates a spatial posture. Current interfaces may hinder the optimal user experience. A thorough reevaluation of how to interact with wearable computers is required. Natural interaction is often hindered by the handling of a physical device. A neural interface eliminates the need for mechanical transducers. Instead, neural interfacing utilizes the phenomenon of ionic exchange between our body and a biopotential sensor. Human interface de uh, devices traditionally come in two flavors, as mentioned before, a pointing device or a character device. The pointing device inputs position, motion, and pressure, and the character device inputs text. Finger tracking technology tracks the position of fingers and hands for generating 3D representations and for discrete input with newer technologies like voice and computer vision-based gesture recognition to perform similar tasks. Driving a car 
and inputting digital commands require similar interactions, at least analogously. Some interactions necessitate high cognitive load and very precise physicality, while other interactions can be performed while multitasking with low cognitive effort. Inline text editing, for example, requires precision similar to the way a driver must maneuver within a crowded parking lot. Both require a lean forward posture and a good degree of focus. Icon browsing is simple. It can be performed with ease, much like driving on urban roads. Roads. Such activities require low cognitive load. Another more relaxed motion would be highlighting an icon using mid-air hand gestures. Like with highway driving, this requires a very low cognitive load. The movements are broader and more relaxed. So the user may navigate through the space more intuitively and efficiently. In the context of Fitt's law, spatial posture requires the lowest level of cognitive load versus its peer group of lean forward and lean back. So GUI or graphical user interface design considerations should, cons should favor decreasing cognitive load. Input should be simple with a low index of difficulty. We're going to be spending quite a few minutes on this slide now. So if you'd like to refer to it in the white paper, it is figure eight. Traditional HCI classifies interactions via the distinctions of input device and interface type. We believe user experience should lead the discussion. Pay close attention. What you're about to learn is fundamental and unique to Wearable Devices Limited and based on thousands of hours of research. It is an attempt to lead the discussion of building a six level HCI fram framework grounded in sound and accepted principles. Neural input devices and brain computer interfaces are not yet widely mainstream. However, the lack of technical and functional maturity does not mean that a standard should not be developed. We offer a comprehensive yet simplified framework for defining the scope for a neural interface. The framework describes and categorizes interaction levels of users based on user activity. Such functionality includes navigating to a certain location, interacting with a digital element, and being aware of location, motion, direction, action, and result. Our simplified framework and taxonomy, taxonomy defines levels of interaction via four parameters, handheld versus hands-free, hands-on versus touchless, big versus small physical movements, and the time it takes to input the command and receive feedback. The HCI new taxonomy framework incorporates six levels labeled zero through five, these definitions should provide a solid grounding for engineers, product managers, designers, and customers. HCI level zero through two incorporate coarse palm, hand, and finger movements. The user must physically hold or touch the interface when inputting commands. A user's expression flow runs as follows. Movement intent, neural signal, muscle movement, input interaction, then digital command. Touch and muscle-based interactions involve keystrokes, point and click, drag and drop finger tap and finger dra dragging. What are examples? HCI level zero incorporates an on-off button, switch toggle or navigation vector. HCI level one devices include computer mice, joysticks and game controllers. HCI level two incorporates touch pads, touch screens and directional pads. Remember multi-capacitive touch? HCI level three through five are only just emerging and should consider several user interactions. These are intent and neural centered commands in often involving nascent AI, that is artificial intelligence, deep learning technologies. The user makes subtle finger movements or non-visible muscle movements. The interaction is hands-free and touchless. The user becomes the interface. Movement intent becomes a command action through neural signals and subtle or even no muscle movement at all. The movement intent immediately turns into command action in levels four and five. So how does the user interact with the interface in HCI level three? With the use of mid-air air gestures, finger movements, and fingertip pressure. Device examples include wrist wearables and gesture sensors. HCI level four incorporates minute to non-detectable movements manifested in either a wearable or an invasive interface. HCI level five's direct brain-to-device interaction is manifested in either a wearable or invasive device, as with level four, and typically involves a heavy reliance on AI, that is artificial intelligence, deep learning. 
Only in HCI level five does the movement intent immediately turn into a digital command. Every other level requires an additional time delay, regardless of physical movement size. We're still bound by the physical reality of our bodies. A clearly defined MVP or minimal vi minimum viable product in XR, in terms of neural input, is wearable, it's touchless, and it's hands-free. As spatial computing becomes more prevalent, users will need features like point and click and drag and drop to input spatial commands on a holographic overlay in a discrete and intuitive way. While this technology simplifies the full potential of neural interfaces, it can be extended to interaction with other devices, such as smart TVs, computers, tablets, and mobile phones, both indoors and outdoors, making it crucial for a seamless user experience with a smooth, smooth transition and a handoff amongst devices. Thanks for your patience so far and for diving in so deep with me. Let me give you a preview of what's coming up next in the seminar. First, we're going to elaborate on the fine balance between functionality, accuracy, and device form factor, with an emphasis on three interdependent layers, hardware, software, and humanware. Following that, we will dive deep into the neural interface specification for the sensor and integrated system. The anti-penultimate -penult section deals with sensor fusion, comparing various sensor types, the penultimate section deals with the mudra band, a neural input device, which is an actual now for sale product. And lastly, if time allows, we will see what an objective chat GPT thinks about the evolution of input standards. Okay, on to balancing functionality, accuracy, and design. Trade-offs between functionality, accuracy, and design are inherently and characteristically necessary. Functional capabilities, a reliable and accurate input method for the widest use of physiologies, and a comfortable, durable, and stylish design that fits the user's habit profile, profile are essential considerations. This is no simple task. Hundreds of trade-offs between contradicting features like size, ergonomics, and user experience must be balanced against number of gestures and ease of use tied to numerous physiologies. A system engineering approach is an essential but often ignored success factor, made more pertinent as it relates to a successful consumer level neural interface product. This system consists of sensors, algorithms, and hardware. The sensors detect and record neural activity. The algorithms interpret this data for meaningful feedback, and the hardware is a comfortable wearable. It cannot be overemphasized that careful selection design and integration of these aforementioned areas is absolutely crucial to mass user adoption. Ultimately, the successful device will accurately detect and interpret neural activity with meaningful feedback that leads to an enhanced user experience. Let's look at a system engineering approach. Software, or rather hardware, software, and humanware. These three levels categorize the user, the wearable product, and the interfacing area. Humanware is the method of incorporating a human facet into hardware and software development. Delving deeper still, hardware includes band design and material, sensors and electrodes, which make up the interfacing hardware and the electronics, including a miniaturized flex rigid PCB. The software piece includes AI learning algorithms, the artificial intelligence algorithm is tuned to run on devices with limited power and processing resources. The humanware is the hand and finger movements, the functions binding these interactions and the user's performance. Humanware should be placed first. Lasting success will come from a natural, intuitive, and user-friendly, comfortable product. The wristbands electrodes are placed on the inner wrist area for convenient and accessible capture and interpretation of neural signals. The wristband form factor is both functional and fashionable with multiple stylish designs, and it is made of soft and flexible biocompatible materials for extended all day wear. Surface versus an implant device. A neural input wearable is a surface level device, meaning it does not require any surgical procedures 
making it a safer and more accessible option for the mass consumer market. Wearables are non-invasive and generally less expensive than implants, but they have limited precision and accuracy in detecting neural signals and may be subject to external interference. Implants can detect neural signals with high precision and accuracy, are not subject to outside interference and provide a more permanent and reliable neural input, but they require invasive surgery are far more expensive and may pose risks such as infection, rejection, or damage to surrounding tissue. To create a successful neural interface product, it is important to balance cutting edge sensors, advanced processing systems, and user-friendly design. Sensor specification parameters include low input referred noise, wise dynamic range, high input impedance, high common mode rejection ratio, or CMRR, and high power rejection ratio, PSRR. System specification parameters include reach, accuracy, latency, and computing power measured in Mac operations. Product specification parameters include the number of electrodes and band dimensions. Neglecting any of these components can lead to a suboptimal product and user experience. Since sensor specification parameters are relatively straightforward and well-established, we focused in the white paper on the system specifications, which need to run real time high volume data streams on low compute power edge devices and on product specifications with which need to be comfortable and durable for various risk sizes, physiologies, and weather conditions. We're up to reach. What is reach? In order to be successful, a neural interface must have high reach. This means it must work for a large proportion of users right out of the box. The minimum reach is 90%. Reach is affected by various factors such as wrist size, user physiology, and electrode design arrangement. Biopotential signals have unique variability challenges. The accuracy of the interface will also vary across users due to intraclass and interclass variability. Achieving high reach requires hardware and algorithm design that considers the defined functionality. Wrist circumference. Since there are a wide range of wrist circumferences ranging roughly from 5.7 to 7.2 inches in the adult population, the surface electrodes capture the neural signals in different lengths. When I do a tap, it creates a unique neural signal pattern and is captured by the device in a slightly different pattern than any one of your taps. The challenge is to generalize the same gesture with a very wide signal pattern variability. User physiology. Each user has a unique physiology, that is the geometry and space in which their ulnar, median, and radial nerve bundles are spread in the wrist, and the amplitude of signals they generate when they perform a gesture. And every time you perform a gesture, the biopotentials are slightly different, so you really need good algorithms to sort this out. Electrode arrangement. Electrode geometry and spacing are fixed, whereas user wrist physiology is varied. The signal pattern we receive for different users may vary immensely. Thus, we need to be able to design and locate the electrodes in such a way as to ensure that we will be able to capture the wrist neural signals for 90% of the target market. And lastly, inter-user variability. As we are dealing with the biology of the human body, in some cases at the edge of the normal distribution, some users may generate a completely opposite signal pattern signature. For example, a thumb movement may look like an index finger movement of a different user. The most common challenge for high reach is the case of an electrode detachment from the wrist skin surface. In that instance, a missing signal pattern is generated. To overcome this challenge, we need to focus on the design of the band and its curvature, the design of the electrodes, and for some extreme user cases, introduce a settings option to adjust the signal intensity. We may also introduce a calibration algorithm procedure in which the user provides a small sample set of each relevant gesture and using this data, a classifier algorithm tunes the neural network, the network weights to the specific user physiology to overcome such challenges. Achieving high reach requires an arrangement of hardware design and algorithm architecture for the defined functionality. Reach for a neural input wristband, as we mentioned, should be at least 90% of the designated intended user base. Accuracy. Accuracy in a neural interface refers to its ability to correctly recognize and interpret user inputs. 
particularly finger movements and their corresponding signal patterns representing gestures. To ensure high accuracy, algorithms must account for both intraclass and interclass variability. Given the recent hype around artificial intelligence, it's easy to overuse the term. But for signal pattern matching deep learning AI, which some companies have been developing for almost a decade, have proven very effective. Accuracy typically trails off as the user set size expands, as shown in this illustration. Accuracy is manifested by classifying a true positive. Noise or false positives can occur anywhere in the feature space and present a challenge for accurate classification. The objective is to develop an AI mapping algorithm that effectively transforms the sensor space into a lower dimensional feature space, ensuring adequate separability between gestures. Unsurprisingly, users express, uh, expect a cross-user accuracy rate of over 96% for the gesture set. Additionally, they expect a very low false positive rate with an average of less than half a false positive per hour. The gestures, gesture set should be natural and intuitive for users to perform, while some gestures, like the so-called bloom gesture, may be easy to classify, they are not natural or intuitive. Achieving high accuracy necessitates addressing factors like intraclass variability, interclass variability, false positives, and motion artifacts. Latency. Latency refers to the delay or elapsed time between a user input gesture and the execution of a digital command. It represents the time it takes for the device to respond to the input. High latency results in a noticeable delay, causing a lag between the user's input and the interface's response. To ensure a smooth and responsive user experience, it is desirable to have low latency. Generally, an acceptable latency range is around 40 to 60 milliseconds, with a sweet point of about 50 milliseconds. For touch-based interfaces, a typical acceptable latency is 50 milliseconds. Keeping latency within acceptable range maintains a seamless user interface interaction. Latency is affected by data packet size, gesture types, the communication module, and the algorithm runtime. Latency in a neural interface includes both algorithm-induced latency and the time taken to transmit a data packet from the interface to digital device. Certain gestures are more sensitive to high latency, such as drag and drop input, which is a continuous gesture that requires longer processing time compared to a simple tap gesture which is a discrete gesture. The size of data packets is determined by the number of sensors and their sampling rate, while the transmission time is influenced by the communication module and its bandwidth. Designing an interface with low latency is essential. Given the constraints of computation and memory bandwidth in low power computing devices, careful system design is necessary to meet user expectations. This involves considering both discrete and continuous gestures. The latency for an input device should ideally be below 50 milliseconds to ensure high responsiveness Precision, pre precision and intuitive interaction. MAC. MAC or multiply and accumulate operations is a numerical metric that quantifies the total computational load and memory requirements of an algorithm. Whew. That was a mouthful. It measures the amount of processing power needed by the compute unit. Performing most computations on the interface devices themselves is important to minimize response time and conserve bandwidth. The MAC is mostly affected by the number of gestures, the algorithm architecture, gesture types, and the training set size. Wearable devices with system on a chip or SOC configurations face limitations in terms of CPU performance. The total number of MAC operations per second is determined by the sensor sampling rate and the algorithm architecture. Remember that deep learning AI, I mentioned previously, maybe once or twice, maybe uh, MAC requirements can vary significantly depending on the sensor type and sampling rates, ranging from a few units to substantial differences. In this context, a 60 millisecond time frame is often used as a reference for the MAC value. The MAC metric helps evaluate the suitability of a computational graph for a neural input method. To calculate MAC, weighted computations involving input samples and weights derived from su supervised learning opti optimization methods, such as neural networks, 
wait a second, isn't that just another term for AI, are performed. It encompasses the extraction of data from memory and the mathematical computations carried out on the input. Neural networks and computational graphs pose challenges in terms of compute time and memory usage. These resources are constrained in low power wearables where edge devices handle local computing and processing of data packets instead of relying on remote servers. Figure 24, now we're really in the weeds, illustrates two possible architectures for neural networks with different layers and operations. The first architecture, the one on the left, consists of two convolutional layers and one fully connected layer, totaling 2,348 multiply and accumulate MAC operations per 60 milliseconds. The second architecture, one on the right, includes convolution, long short-term memory LSTM, and a fully connected layer mounting to 822 MAC operations per 60 milliseconds of sensor data. Figure 25 presents tables summarizing the number of parameters, MAC operations, and CPU usage for modern computer vision-based classifiers. The tables demonstrate that neural networks designed for computer vision tasks are significantly more computationally demanding compared to sensor-based artificial intelligence systems. So it would seem that inevitably, neurogestural recognition will be used for more than simplified and natural pointing functionality. MAC operations serve as key metrics for resource-constrained classifiers and regressors, particularly in fixed-point signal processing. Given the limitations of CPU usage and memory bandwidth in low-power wearables, this metric is valuable when evaluating the feasibility of a computational architecture for neural input. The provided figures and tables offer insights into the computational requirements of various vision-based classifiers and highlight the differences in resource utilization between different architectures and models. The MAC metric is useful when evaluating the viability of a computational architecture to be used for neural input. Number of electrodes. Spatial re re resolution is critical in a risk-worn wearable. Uh, sorry, in a wrist-worn neural interface, as it allows for distinguishing between different signal sources, partic particularly the ulna, medium, and radial nerve innervations. Insufficient spatial resolution due to a limited number of sensors can hinder accurate classification of subtle finger movements. However, having too many electrodes may cause discomfort during prolonged wear and may be aesthetically unappealing, impacting user adoption. Remember, look, sell. The number of electrodes is dictated by user physiology, how much surface skin real estate that we can cover, the electrode arrangement, the gesture types, and of course, the number of gestures. We propose the three, that three electrodes should suffice for point, click, and drag and drop functionality. A minimum of two sensors is required for spatial resolution to differentiate noise from finger innovation, especially when one sensor loses contact with the skin. In such, cases, in such cases, the classification can take the, into account the skin contact conditions. Three sensors can provide higher accuracy, but come with increased design complexity. Several other factors need to be considered in sensor electrode design, such as electrode materials, inter-electrode distance, and electrode properties. These aspects are crucial as electrodes come in direct contact with the user's skin and determine the number of signal sources captured by the device. Achieving a comfortable and functional wearable interface relies heavily on electrode count and design. Figure 27 illustrates an electrode configuration supporting spatial differentiation. The major challenge for a wrist-warm neural interface is electrode detachment from the skin. A three electrode configuration can provide accurate classification and reliable functionality even when one of the electrodes loses skin contact. Onto wristband geometry. The band for a wrist-worn neural interface should have dimensions and geometry similar to a typical watch strap or wristband wearable. I have some experience there. It should be designed to accommodate various hand and wrist movements without causing discomfort. The band's thickness should not exceed eight millimeters and its width should not exceed 20 millimeters to maintain a sleek and comfortable profile. Choosing a wrist warm form factor offers greater comfort and convenience as the wrist is a natural and familiar location for wearing devices and is socially acceptable and aesthetically appealing, resembling a traditional watch band. 
This design allows compatibility with existing watches or wristbands, making it a natural extension for wearable accessories. Additionally, it facilitates improved sensor placement close to the skin surface without interfering with other sensors, enhancing the accuracy and reliability of biopotential signal readings from the supple subtle finger movements. As a 20-year veteran of the traditional watch business, I've seen my fair share of watch band designs. And the thoughtfulness that goes into a watch band by those firms and product managers and designers smart enough to give it consideration to ultimately read the benefits from a happy fan base. The band's geometry is typically designed with the form follows function approach, considering common usage scenarios. The material used for the band should possess key attributes like flexibility, durability, and biocompatibility. Integrating flexible electronics into the band presents practical challenges, sometimes significant. Creating a bendable, malleable, durable, and biocompatible bracelet is an active area of research. Bending and elongation are specific challenges to address as they impose different stress conditions on the band. A dynamic design with both rigid and flexible electronics is susceptible to various physical stresses with elongation potentially putting high stress on flex rigid connectivity. The design is typically limited to a certain radiant radius of flexion. Band geometry considerations also come into play when integrating technology into existing smartwatch bands. Some components may become redundant, leading to new PCB layouts and functionality requirements. Band dimensions, power connections, communications connections, al and algorithms may require adjustments to accommodate these changes. Achieving a ubiquitous band geometry dimensioning necessitates close interdependency between hardware, software, and functionality design. Whew. Okay, we made it to the other side of that. Let's summarize. We spent a good deal of time on the neural interface specifications. We've looked at these six parameters and product specifications from the perspective of building a device that satisfies the following goals. Comfort, accuracy, and functional input for all day wear that is durable and can handle electrode detachment. On to sensor fusion. What is sensor fusion? We need sensors that work in tandem with finger and wrist movements to evaluate the absolute position of the hand relative to the body. Picking the correct sensor array is part of the challenge in accurately decoding the user's movement and intent. Because all sensor types have limitations, sensor fusion improves the probability that there will always be a sensor that performs well in any given situation. Thus, each sensor must work independently. It took time for multi-capacitive capabilities, what you use on your smartphone in many use cases, to supplant the more traditional keyboard and mouse. For smart wearables, gesture recognition sensors are now leading the next revolution in spatial navigation. A sensor and a signal condition unit are all that is necessary to create a transducer. The transducer converts a physical quantity into a digital electrical quantity, which can be used to input commands. The input device may be static, dynamic, or worn on the body and be either external or internal. External sensors measure non-electrical quantities such as force, movement, pressure, and torque. External sensors examples include a mouse, keyboard, and touchpad. Biopotential sensors such as EEG, EMG, PPG, and SNC sensors measure electrical activity in the brain or muscles, blood volume changes, and pressure gradations, offering natural and non-invasive interfaces but they require expertise to interpret the signals and can be affected by external noise and factors. Surface nerve conductance sensors are a type of non-invasive sensor used in wearables. They react to ions and detect innervation mostly through wrist movements. These sensors offer a non-invasive and convenient way to track physiological signals, such as real-time measurement of pressure gradations, and they can be highly accurate in detecting minute changes in the body. However, although these effects can be mitigated, SNC sensors can be affected by various sources of noise, such as humidity and sweat, which can decrease their accuracy. Additionally, calibration may be necessary to ensure accurate measurements, and these sensors require constant physical contact with the skin. The Mudra Band is an aftermarket wearable that enables users to operate Apple products across their entire ecosystem using intuitive finger movements and gestures without the need for external physical touch. It supports point and click, 
drag and drop, and sleep, seamless switching between connected devices like iPhone, iMac, iPad, Apple TV, smart glasses, and mobile gaming devices. The Mudra Band's functionality has undergone extensive testing and approval by a global community of Apple enthusiasts. The Mudra technology offers an AI-powered touchless sensing wearable that can be used with any Bluetooth-connected device and operating system. The gestures supported by Mudra technology can be tailored to specific use cases and easily integrated to, into existing wrist wearables, smartwatches, AR glasses, VR headsets, and other connected electronic devices. It does supports discrete gestures such as simple finger movement or soft tapping, continuous gestures like applying different pressures to manipulate digital objects, and air touch gestures like slide to unlock, combining discrete and continuous gestures with hand and forearm movements. With its customizable gestures and immersive input experience, the Mudra Band aims to shape the input landscape for extended reality, providing an intuitive and natural way to control and interact with devices. Mudra enables comfortable and familiar spatial input gestures with a wrist-worn wearable that is currently being manufactured and shipping very soon. Figure 30 here showcases examples of interaction types and input gestures supported by the Mudra Band, including discrete gestures, continuous gestures, and air touch gestures. The human wrist has been a significant area of interest for thousands of years, as nerve bundles and arteries lie just beneath the skin, allowing for the sensing of electrical conductance and collection of valuable data related to bodily functions. The wrist serves as valuable real estate, as it were, for sensing the human body, and wrist-worn digital accessories, applications, and services form an ecosystem that utilizes biopotential signals for various purposes, such as fitness tracking, remote monitoring, and digital input. This technology can also be applied to track hand and finger movements and their corresponding neural signals. In industrial setting, monitoring and analyzing hand movements can help identify if manual tasks are performed accurately, preventing losses in later production stages. Assessing employee stress levels and performance degradation is essential for employee well-being and health. In sports tracking, athlete activity improves performance and generates insights. Neural signal tracking can enhance designated routines and repetitions of hand instrument interactions by utilizing muscle memory movements. Sports analytics, informed by the collection and analysis of historical data, aid decision making for players, coaches, and support staff, leading to improved motor skills and an intuitive understanding of body mechanics for various play movements in sports like basketball, golf, baseball, and tennis. In our white paper presentation, we highlighted the importance of developing an accurate and comfortable neural input interface for human computer interaction. We discussed key factors impacting the design and performance of neural wristband and their interconnectedness. To create a natural interface, we proposed a bracelet or wristband form factor that can be attached to a smartwatch case. It should prioritize comfort, durability, and fashionability, since the wrist is a valuable area for wearable devices. We argued that the wrist form factor is optimized for extended reality experiences, especially for smart glasses. When interacting with digital elements on smart glasses, it is crucial to accurately predict user intent without compromising the product's form factor. Motion artifacts and variations in user physiology can negatively affect system accuracy and performance, resulting in inconsistent input. Therefore, a neural wearable wristband must be designed to accommodate dynamic conditions and ensure ease of use. Achieving a balance between ease of use and accuracy requires that careful trade-offs be made. Overall, our presentation emphasized the need for an accurate and comfortable neural input interface while considering design, performance, and trade-offs associated with such devices. Thank you for your time. Uh, I believe now we will do a Q&A session um, that we still have some time remaining. I will look for the open questions in, in the Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, a question. Uh, I'm not going to mention the, the the user just just in case that's private information. 
Uh, on slide 20, we outline a new framework. Is this framework fully developed by wearable devices? What do you see for the future of wearable devices technology and what is needed to facilitate mass adoption of wearables? Two amazing questions. So uh, on the first question, I'm going to answer myself. The second question, I'll let ChatGPT answer for you. I actually had prepared that, but thanks for the question. Um, on slide 20, the new framework, which uh, perhaps, well, I, I don't think I'll, I'll jump back to that. It might confuse some people, but on slide 20, that's the, the the, the, the large slide with all of the framework designations for HCI level zero through five. It is in fact developed by us. We do, uh, we uh, collaborated with uh, a lot of partners and customers in coming up with that framework, but uh, it is open to discussion. And that is why we're publishing it at this early date because the technology is uh, rapidly evolving and we need to be able to prepare a framework for those people who are entering into uh, this area. Uh, what do you see for the future of wearable devices technology and what is needed to facilitate mass adoption? So uh, it's very interesting, uh, before, before pre um, preparing this webinar, I actually went to ChatGPT4 and asked it a whole bunch of questions about what that, suppose it was wearing a next generation wristband. And I told it that it it read neural signals and it measures ionic discharge at the wrist. And then I said, the device has six electrodes to read real-time signals from the median ulna and radial nerves and was very impressed. And then I told it that it had deep learning AI to detect signals across the entire demographic, still further impressed. And then I said it has already been tested on an ALS patient effectively, that it won best wearable CES 2021 and the PADI Center best of CES 2023. And then I said, with all of this in mind, could you please tell me, how would you predict where this kind of technology is going? Because I, I said to it, you know, this is a device that's been developed and it thought that it was quite impressive and it, it suggested that it wouldn't have developed anything differently. So I said, where do you see this technology progressing in five years? And this is how it answered. Enhanced sensor capabilities. Wearables may incorporate more advanced sensors to gather a wide range of data, enabling more accurate and comprehensive health monitoring, biometric measurements, and activity tracking. Okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. Improved artificial intelligence integration. Knocked it out of the park there. This is what wearable devices has been working on. Deep learning AI algorithms will become <clears throat> more sophisticated, allowing wearables to better understand and interpret user data provide personalized insights and recommendations and adapt to individual needs and preferences. Seamless integration and internet of things. Wearables will play a crucial role in the IoT ecosystem, seamlessly connecting with other smart devices and services to provide a holistic and interconnected user experience. This integration may enable automated actions based on user preferences and context. Extended healthcare applications. Wearables will increasingly be utilized in healthcare settings enabling continuous monitoring of vital signs, early detection of health conditions, and remote patient monitoring. This can improve disease management, enhance telemedicine capabilities, and facilitate proactive healthcare interventions. And it goes on and on, five, six, seven, and eight. What was very interesting is then I then proceeded to ask it what would happen in 10 years, and then what would happen in 20 years, and even in 25 years. And by 25 years, we already have neural augmentation, uh, biomedical breakthroughs, ambient intelligence, quantum computing applications. But what I found most gratifying was the fact that uh, ChatGPT with only four or five prompts that just basically said what our current technology has predicts where it's going. And I couldn't agree with them more. I, our product roadmap looks pretty much like ChatGPT is predicting. The second question I have yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on in this webinar. I see it's being recorded. This is, no, uh, just... okay, yes. Um, so your, your question was, uh, will you be able to digest it better afterwards? I completely understand the need for that. Yes, we will be breaking it down into a selection of videos and publishing it online. And we hope to uh, put out when that will be. It should be rather rapidly. I do understand that there was a lot discussed. I took a 28 page white paper and tried to distill it into, we made it in 50 minutes to this point right now. Uh, it actually takes a lot longer to read the 28 pages. I don't believe I've missed 
much if anything of the, the, the core, but you should go obviously back to the white paper to see much, uh, much more discussion on some of these topics and for more depth. And please, of course, do contact us uh, at wearable devices, white paper at wearable devices.co.il. And of course, you can download the white paper at wearable devices.co.il forward slash white paper. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I see some of the other questions, but those will be covered uh, by the videos that will be put up later on. Thank you very much for all of your time. I do know that we had a longer period booked, uh, but I do like to try and cover things as quickly as possible in as easy to digest form as possible. And hopefully I've achieved that. Once again, thank you, everybody.